Um, my name is Emily Vogel. I'm from the Oregon Guidance and Belief Center. Um, from government. We are an independent, nonpartisan opinion research firm in Oregon. And we conduct statewide opinion research of the general population rather than likely voters. That's important because there are people that get left out when you just look at what likely voters are going to say. Um, we also stratify our sample, and what that means is we break out different categories. So, what do men say? What do women say? What do people from different areas of the state say? What do people from urban areas say? What do people from rural areas say? And that's important because a lot of times rural communities in particular don't have access to information that's specific to their community. A normal, um, especially likely voter, but even the general population sample, is going to draw a lot of people from the metro areas. And that means that people in rural communities don't have great information to make decisions and plan for their communities. Um, anybody can join our panel to take our surveys. Today, I'm going to talk about a healthcare survey that we just finished one on consumer rights and protections and on um, at the education system. So, first, we'll talk about healthcare, what people think about physical versus mental health, and the importance placed for the individual versus how society views physical and mental health. And postponing treatment. We asked our Oregonians to give an academic type grade to our healthcare system in our state. Um, I, mean, I see a lot of complaints, people talking about things that they find wrong. So I was actually kind of surprised to see 40% give our healthcare system a passing grade, 31% um, give it a B, and only 5% give it an F. So that's honestly. Not too bad. I'm a little surprised. So we asked Oregonians if they think that physical health is more important for individuals, mental health is more important for individuals, or if they are equally important. And overwhelmingly, people say they are equally important, 81%. In Oregon, there's not a ton of issues, but 81% of us agree. <laughs> um, but then we asked if society treats mental health as more important, physical health as more important, or as equally important. And overwhelmingly, people say physical health is treated to be more important as opposed to what they would like to see, which is those treated equally. So then we asked Oregonians in the past 12 months if they have experienced any of the following. And 55% of Oregonians have postponed medical or dental or mental health care uh, for various reasons. So more than half of the population. We asked specifically about postponed med medical or dental health care appointment, postponed acquiring new mental health, dental health, or general health care. Postponed a mental health care appointment, postponed or declined a refill on prescription medications. For all of these, women are more likely to have postponed their care, um, and younger Oregonians are more likely, especially under age 54, to have postponed care. So, next we're going to talk about Oregonians' feelings about maintaining their insurance coverage. We asked them over the next 12 months if they're worried that they or someone else in their household might lose access to their insurance coverage. Well, this is actually a benchmark from a Colorado study. We like to test, especially with states that have a similar political makeup, just to sort of baseline what we're doing. Our results are pretty similar to Colorado, but I think mean, off by like one or two percent. So Combined, not worried, 62% for the next year. Combined worry, 36%. And yes, that means the majority of Oregonians aren't concerned, but that's still more than a third. So one in three people are worried about maintaining their coverage over the next year. Next, we ask about coverage over the next five years. And this is really important to notice 
the wording in this one because we asked about maintaining their present coverage at an acceptable cost to you over the next five years. Combined confidence is 39%, kind of middle of the road is at 37%, so those are almost equal. And lacking confidence is 24%. Um, women are more likely than men to be worried about maintaining coverage. Um, those over 65 are not that worried, and those over 75 are especially not worried. But there's more of a story here. Um, this is a question that has been asked before in the market. So in 2007, DHM also asked this question on the five point scale. And you can see the people that are worried, it's about the same. But then you look at the next section. And that's where it gets really concerning. In 2007, only 17% were in that middle Kind of worried, not super worried. I mean, the category is called somewhat worried um, about maintaining their coverage. In 2024, that's at 37%. In 2007, 52% were not worried about maintaining their coverage over the next five years. That's down to 39%. We asked for our rulings about actions that could be taken to improve our healthcare system, to address needs in our state um, below so below are some possible healthcare actions our society might take indicate how desirable you feel each one is they're all pretty popular but some of the interesting ones particularly in this conversation are uh, doctors doctors fees are regulated based on providing preventative care and good health rather than treating poor health and people with no insurance will pay no more than the amount insurance companies pay for identical procedures. And that one has the strongest support. I mean, if you look overall, at overall support, whether it's strong or somewhat, rigorous evaluation and ethical considerations guiding decisions on publicly funded medical services, that gets the greatest overall support. But when it comes to strong support, people with no insurance paying the same as insurance companies get the most strong support. So what that means for us is people are concerned about the costs of healthcare in our state. And what that costs not only them, but those in their community. Next week, we made it a little more complicated for people. So we asked them about some more options, but if they support an option, it, it is associated with increased cost in taxes or in what you pay for goods and services. So that puts a little more skin in the game. The most support goes to ensure all people have equal access to a basic level of quality health care at 74%. So three quarters, we're almost to that 80% again. People want everyone to have access to health care. Provide access, uh, sorry, acceptable quality prenatal care. That one's at 71%. Provide incentives for healthcare providers to serve rural and other underserved locations. That's at 67%. That one is interesting because the people that support it the most are people living in urban areas and rural areas. So not only are people worried about their own communities, they're worried about other communities in Oregon having access to healthcare and um, how we can make that happen especially for quality of health care. But I'm sure you all are most interested in ensure a universal publicly funded health delivery system to replace the system we have now. And that's at 59%, which um, it's not the highest, obviously, but that is a number that has been creeping up over time. And so thanks to hard work from people like you all, that strong foundation is increasing over time. We really see a lot of support statewide for this as well. Um, and more support among older folks than among younger folks. So next we ask people about access to care. So I'm gonna go back to that postponing care question. We ask people if they had postponed their care, but right after that question, we actually ask them why they postponed their care.
So we have a we had a whole list of options, and we actually pulled it from an older survey and based it on what people had said an open-ended question to capture all the categories that people normally say. These are the top five answers: cost of living, affordability, insurance issues, difficult to find a provider with availability, and difficult to find time in your life. And I mean, if you combine cost of living and affordability, those are very intertwined. And so that's really strong support for people's concerns about the cost of healthcare and people are postponing their medical care for those reasons, which really costs us more in the long run. It's also worth noting that the next most popular answer, like number six, it's all the way down to 18%. So these are really strongly the top five reasons why people are postponing care. So we always ask people open-ended questions because you can learn so much more about um, the nuances of people's experiences and why they give particular answers based on what they say in their own words. And it can do things like help inform your own elevator speech about why um, healthcare should be a right. Um, I'm not gonna read all these, but I, the slides will be able to be shared for everybody. Um, but the overall message is that affordability, again, it's, it's a problem for people throughout the state. And people are concerned not only about affordability for themselves, but affordability for others in the community as well. We got a lot of people that said, I have great coverage, but I'm worried about other people in my community who don't. So the other issue that we see a lot with um, healthcare in particular is access. Um, and we're really seeing an increase in that in our surveys. We may ask about something not related to healthcare and healthcare access comes up because people are struggling to get appointments with physical healthcare doctors, specialists, and mental healthcare doctors. And that really impacts their overall life, including their economic well-being in particular. Um, and then we have special circumstances, especially outside the metro areas where they're having trouble with housing, they're having trouble with recruitment and retention, and um, keeping good care providers in the area in addition to the corporatization of healthcare. So I also included some um, other examples because there are particular angles that we see. So um, accessibility to resources is definitely lacking due to lack of funding for those very resources. So people think the system is overtaxed and they're not funding it at a level that makes it accessible for everyone. Um, and that is for mental health and for physical health. Um, it is worth noting people on OHPE and on Medicare generally in our survey express pretty high satisfaction with their coverage and uh, aren't as worried about losing their coverage or not as, not experiencing as many issues with affordability and getting access to care, but they do see that as a problem for other times and there are sometimes uh, longer wait times and hoops to jump through. Um, and this insurance shouldn't get to determine what meds I can take. My doctor should be in charge of that. We are seeing a concern around those issues as well. Um, things like when a generic is, is covered, but the name brand is no longer covered by an insurance company, and that becomes an even bigger issue with our um, suffering pharmaceutical uh, pharmacy facilities in Oregon, then if you have to jump through extra hoops because your preferred prescription is not available, it can really be a nightmare for people. Another thing that we're seeing is that people see healthcare as integrated into other particularly thorny issues that we're facing in our state, whether that's homelessness, whether that's high school graduation. We see people that say, I'm worried about kids and their mental health, 
and I'm worried about graduation rates, and they tie those things together. Um, there are also really significant issues. Like it's it's really important when you're talking to people to remember there are people really suffering, as, uh, especially with affordability and lack of access here. Uh, so there's a pretty heartbreaking in the last one as well. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm going to struggle to keep the mic close to my mouth. So tell me. If it, if it, um, and I'm not going to be turning to look because as I was trying to turn to look, I got a print in my neck. So I'm going to be looking at my printed slides and I might be looking a little bit. I apologize for that. But unbelievably, this is my first in person presentation since COVID. I have been really lucky to be able to in my pajamas, but out of my So is there, are there are there any people on the screen right now? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> today we're going to talk about. Oh, oh, this slide. Oh, this yeah. is this. They don't run together. Okay. No, gotcha. I uh, let me let me just. <laughs> you don't want to damage your neck. All right. I'm really excited to hear the questions that people have here. Um, I worked on one of the first, they do a really great job of gathering information and also spreading information. I don't know about Browder. You're raising your hand. Okay, what well, the slide we posted on the website is hard for us to see. For everyone but you. <laughs> How about now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Slides will be shared. Slides will be shared, they say. All right, slide show and set up. Anyway, Values and Peace does a great job of getting information out to people. And um, I worked on the, the tool very early on. Um, I think it was about 15 years ago. And one of the things that I took away, it's so obvious, I'm gonna oh. say it, I'm gonna be embarrassed that it hasn't occurred to me before, is that people, what I learned from the first guys and leaves I worked on, oh. is that people view public policy through the lens of their family and how is it going to affect their family. That's so obvious, but to see it articulated in that way really changed the way I talk about policy. I always bring it back to our family and our community. So thank you for that. Um. All right. I don't know why it's not working. It's not working. I can I can pull it up so you they the people will be able to see it, but it doesn't want to present. <laughs> um, but can people is that big enough for people to read? No. Okay. Then no, it's it's fine. I was just checking if it was big enough because I'm saying I'm telling it to present and it uh, doesn't open anything. So I'll just restart it. I apologize for the pause. Let me see if. Restarting the whole thing. Okay. So one of the things that struck me, well, there were a lot of things that struck me, <laughs> but um, you said 74% of those who, 74% um, of people think that everyone should have access to care, even if it means raising taxes. And that even if it means raising taxes, is it really key? Because that's the argument we always see. Oh, we can't read tax notes. So I wanted to highlight that and kind of confirm that that's what it was. Really? 74%? Wow. And then 59% think that the solution to that or the way to accomplish that is to publicly fund it, which is everything that's saying it's right? And did, did, was the phrase publicly funded used in the questions or what, what was that phrase you used? So this time in particular, we said establish a universal publicly funded health delivery system to replace the systems we have now. And um, it's interesting that you asked about the wording in particular, because in September and October, we actually asked a similar question 
about medical services. This was not in a healthcare specific survey. This was a more broad general survey. And we said, which statement comes closest to your view about the cost and availability of medical care services? Um, I'm sorry, that isn't actually the question. Um, it's which one do you want? And you have to pick one or the other as a forced choice. It, it's really hard for people. But we gave them either keep the current system as is with private insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, safety net clinics, and veterans insurance, or move the healthcare system of physicians, hospitals, insurance, and trauma to a unified, integrated, single care system. And when you work it that way and say single payer, the support did drop to 48%. So how you're talking about this and how you're asking people about it changes their perception of what they're supporting or not supporting. Um, and there, the reality is there's some, I don't want to say ignorance, but just a lack of understanding of what either of those things mean yeah. for people yeah. and what that means in their everyday life. Right. Okay. One quick follow-up. Oh, so, so the term publicly funded, I think some people think of that as like the government will pay the private insurance companies, which is how some other countries work. The other ones, I think, has a system like that. Um, so for those questions, do you think it's like people are just a little more allergic to the term single payer, or do they actually think of it as well, I think publicly funded private insurance versus government funded insurance? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think that I when when you say publicly funded, I think people see it as they're paying for it with their taxes, and their comments reflect that. This is people that say, um, "I don't want to pay for healthcare that somebody else didn't earn or whatever." Um, so I don't think it's that they think. The government will pay for it and they won't. Um, I think it's just about what people associate with single care versus when you use a more general term that doesn't have maybe as much political baggage, people can uh, feel more comfortable showing more support. That is such a good segue for me. That is a perfect segue for me. So I'm going to be talking about how to not talk about that. <laughs> the values that you want outcomes that you want in the healthcare system. And we have a really good example in this room, I think, and it is the back of Dick's shirt. What say on the back of Dick's shirt? Healthcare is the right. No, no, not that. On the back of your shirt. Yeah. That's my wife. <laughs> Unified care, efficient, and fair. Unified care, efficient, and fair. That is something that I can understand. That's about my health care. Not who pays for it, not what public policies are, but something that I would want for my health care. So it's very outcome based what we're going to talk about today in value space. So now there are people up on the screen, right? Yes. There are people up on the screen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, so, talk about that space message. We go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so, as I think was mentioned in my bio, this is great. I have my readers on, so you're all fuzzy. <laughs> as was mentioned in my bio, I did work on the Families USA messaging guide. It's a 2020 messaging guide. Some of the issues around access to healthcare haven't come up yet. We haven't seen the max exodus or the exhausted healthcare workers. Um, so, some of the messaging was a little different. Uh, but it's still, I think, really helpful in thinking about how people process information about public policy. And I'm also going to be using it as an example and actually showing more examples of messaging from that, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation messaging on structural racism in healthcare, which I did not work on, but I had a lovely conversation with them a few weeks ago, and I'm super excited about this project. And in addition to our slides, I know Mary Beth will send out these resources to folks as well. Next slide, please. So the hope is on the screen. Okay, so, so when we think about, and uh, I know I'm seeing this in the, you guys do focus groups or? 
on its array. So people are really mad right now. People are really upset right now. People have a hard time believing in anything. They are really overwrought. They don't have health care. They don't have child care. They don't have long term care. And they can't figure out how to negotiate their lives in end stage capitalism. It's really, really, really hard. And the media narrative, the pundit narrative, is that we are all so divided, we could never come together on anything. We could never cross the void. That's not exactly true. And so what we're going to talk about today is how to talk about, talk to anybody about the vision that you have for people's health and health care. Next slide. Please. They're happy people on the screen. Happy, happy people are on the screen. <laughs> so as I mentioned, the Families USA project that I was involved in was done in August of 2020. Dr. Drew Weston, who was in the departments of psychology and psychiatry at Emory, did national online dial tests. And dial tests make really, really, really long messages, which is one of the reasons I'm not going to show you all the messages, because they're messages that are too long for you to use. But they do help understand what lights up people's brains. And this is something that Dr. Weston really gets excited about. You can see a graphic of the brain here in a minute. He likes to look at what lights people's brains up and what gets them engaged and to agreement on the policies that he's working on. And so the people that they, and again, this is national, this is not Oregon based. Um, the sample was weighted to reflect the voting population because the purpose of this guide that families did is they wanted to influence Congress and the president to take action. It was new in the Biden, the Biden administration when they rolled it out. Um, so they did the voting population, including 50% of voters who described themselves in the middle of the road. They were Republican and Democrat, but they weren't super strong on either one. And they heard 90 second messages, which is a really long message. Like that's the length of an entire NPR story. No one's going to sit through that entire message. But you learn a lot from them. Um, that we have head to head from the negative messages that our opponents use against any kind of health reform. And they were testing public option. They had a specific agenda that they wanted to advance. Another reason I'm not going to show you all that message. Uh, but they were able to identify which phrases elicited positive responses and which phrases elicited fear. Next slide, please. So they learned that outside of the headlines and the polls about political divisions, there are united beliefs on health reform um, and united fears. Americans believe that every child, every family, every individual should have access to quality, affordable health care, and they should not face financial ruin if they need help or need care. Too many people have been shut out due to cost, coverage, or color, and leaders must come together and finally fix the problem. So that's what we learned about what unites people. And we also learned that we've been making some things, some mistakes about how we talk about health policy and health care reform. And this is something that I also learned when I was working at the Health Authority, where I had a delightful assignment to talk about health care and government together, the two most complicated systems that we have. Um, we tend to, and especially people on our team, tend to think if we give people more information, they will listen to us. We think that people make decisions based on facts. Well, I guess not everybody here thinks that because I see some agreement. <laughs> that is not true. My husband thinks that, I will tell you that. He thinks if he has something hard to tell me, he starts at the beginning of how he made the decision, all the processes he went through, the information that he gathered, and then he finally tells me, oh, wait, we need to have a pledge that you guys are not going to share this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> then he will finally tell me how he got to that conclusion. When really all I want to know is what is the conclusion and how is it going to affect me? And do I agree with it? I don't need all the data that got us to that point. Next slide, please. This is the brain slide. Yep. So we're doing um, while we find common ground, different words and sequences, sequences of words, phrases can trigger different responses. So no matter the topic, science, let's let's talk about science. So it's going to be ironic to use two facts to say don't talk about facts. Um, science teaches us that our values drive our political response, not policy arguments, and it happens really, really fast. So we don't have much time. Next slide, more brain. So here are the words that um, people had a positive association with during the dial testing and the words that created that 
trigger their fear responses. They like choice. They like security. They like high quality care, affordable care, comprehensive care, healthcare for everyone, a solid basic plan no matter what happens. It's that security. Problem solving from our leaders and real bipartisan solutions. They are afraid of losing what they have. As Valerie said, they like their health care coverage for the most part. They don't want to lose it. They are afraid of insecurity, high deductibles, premiums and co-pays, prescription, high prescription drug costs, socialized medicine, and they are angry that nothing has been done. Next. So the strongest me messages, and again, I'll give you some examples from Robert Johnson that follow the same pattern. Activate the right neural networks, speak to values and emotions, and tell coherent, memorable stories. Next slide. So successful policy storytelling, as I've said like 500 times, but in communicators, I'm going to repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, connect with values and metaphors such as we all deserve the same quality of care or a family doctor. They raise concerns about antagonists or the impediments to success, such as racial and economic inequality, insurance and drug companies, or politicians, well, being politicians failing to lead. And they restore hope. You gotta leave them with something to hope for, something to believe in. Um, end with a resolution such as, and this is where families was coming from, letting Medicare be an option, opening Medicaid up, and tackling imp impediments to health equity and access. Again, if logic worked, if the facts worked, we would have a really different country or world than we have today. Next slide. Think so some small sound bites that were effective. Our health should not depend on our wealth. It rhymes. That's really good. <laughs> um, we should have the freedom to choose what's best for our family's health, whether we're white, black, or brown. Everyone who lives in America deserves the, the same health care politicians get because they were talking about families. <laughs> are state reps and senators in the I should know that. They, yes. They are. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, talking point slide is up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, short and strong messages about access. Here's a couple of examples, not the long ones, about access, affordability, and coverage. All of us should have an opportunity to live a healthy life and receive high quality health care, regardless of our race, ethnicity, or gender. I believe in a family doctor for every family. No one in this country should ever have to worry that they can't afford health care or have to choose between filling the prescription or paying their rent or mortgage. That's not talking about how we get that family doctor. It's just we believe that we should all have a family doctor. Our elected representatives shouldn't have a better health care plan. There's a type of health care plan for the rest of us. We should give them one year to fix the problem. Again, this is the urgency families was bringing a couple of years ago. And if they can't come to an agreement, their families and staff can pick from whatever options the rest of us have. See how they like that. It's time we took an honest, nonpartisan look at what has and hasn't worked in health reform and fixed the problems already. That's the urgency. It's time to finish the job we started, not tear it down. And this is a very COVID specific message, but this was on a graphic, and so I couldn't change this slide. It's time the world's military superpowers treat health as a national security issue, which threatens our lives and security as surely as any foreign enemy would. So that was the family's messaging. And then the next slide, are there bridges on the screen? There are bridges on the screen. Okay, so this is the Robert Wood Johnson uh, work that they did on value-based messaging on structural racism and health. And they came up with this metaphor of a bridge, which when you're talking about structural racism works on so many different levels. I mean, immediately for me, it's the Evan Pettis Bridge. Like I could picture the march, I could picture moving forward. It's just a really great, a great metaphor and their goal, like the Families USA goal, is to reach as many people as possible with messages that connect and resonate. In the next couple of slides, I'll share the messages that were um, best. They, under their research, they said 75% of, of the Americans that they talk to already see a connection between structural racism and health. 31% are with it. Wait, I didn't quite phrase it right. Are open to the conversation about um, structural racism and health. 31% are with us and 44%, they're open to the conversation. So we wanna be having that conversation with the 44%. 
Um, and again, this, these are based, these are values based messages. And the values that they found resonated with people the most, and you'll see them woven through all of the messages, is opportunity, which is social mobility, removing barriers for all people, inclusivity, embracing and benefiting, benefiting everybody, no matter where we come from or what we look like. Unity, joining together, working together for the best future of all children and grandchildren, working together for the best future for all children and grandchildren. Isn't that lovely? I mean, that's really thinking about the future. Justice, ensuring laws that treat ensuring that laws treat everyone as an equal and worthy person. And again, hope, positive, affirming message. All right. Another message from the screen. Oh, okay, good. So the shared values-based ideal. We all want to live in a United States where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to reach their best health and well being, no matter their race, ethnicity, or class. Did everybody see the reader board for the church when you came in that said yes. Jesus supports or supported universal health care? Yes. I would change that message. I would say we all and Jesus support universal health care because it doesn't need to be, you know, somebody in power. It's us. It's our shared value. Positive vision and problem rooted in place. This can happen, getting to our shared value by making sure everyone gets quality health care from doctors who respect them. Doctors, doctors who respect them. We feel so disrespected by our healthcare system. It can happen when families live in communities with well-funded schools and parks instead of polluted air and toxic waste dumps, and in neighborhoods with access to safe and affordable homes. We can build a society where people can move up economically and socially. But this is not everyone's reality today, right? This is the problem. These are the barriers. That's because there are next sentence. That's because there are barriers in front of some of us that create unequal opportunity and threaten freedom and prosperity. And the call to action is by joining together, we can unite to create a better future for everyone's children and grandchildren. Next slide. Thank you. The shared values based idea for this next message. And again, it's not just one message. And all of these you would want to adapt because you're going to, hopefully these are triggering stories that you know about people who have been neg negatively affected. And so you can weave them into the stories because stories are really important. We all have dreams for ourselves and our families, but we don't all have the same opportunities and opportunities to make those dreams come true. There are laws and social practices that place more value on some lives than, lives than others based on race and class. And that leads to fewer opportunities in jobs, education, lending, and housing, and unfair differences in the legal system. Our zip code shouldn't dictate our health. Everyone should have the opportunity to live the healthiest life possible in the place they call home. Since people created the laws and social practices, right? What a good line. Since people created the laws and social practices that shape these opportunities, we can reinvent them. We can work together so that everyone's children and grandchildren can have the best possible future and everyone can achieve their best health and well being. So next slide is do's and don'ts. Yep. I should have changed the order because now I'm on high and then I have to talk about do's and don'ts. Right. So the do's from this messaging is share a positive collective vision to break through negativity and cynicism. The whole can get calmed down, right? Increase people's sense that change is possible. Focus on place and barriers that people confront. Don't focus on prob problems without offering solutions. And don't talk about problems more than solutions and don't use absolutes. There's another campaign that I recently became aware of is by the national presidential election. I'll have a slide on it. It's by the Human Rights Campaign and it's called We Show Up. And they're the national LGBT, LGBTQ plus organization. And their research found that the people that they serve are so tired of crisis and they wanted something aspirational that we all show up together. And when we show up together, we can make change. I recommend you Google it or look at their YouTube videos. They will make you cry. They are so beautiful. All right, next slide is messaging in action. And I don't know if we're gonna do Q&A first before people take another stab at the... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
So we started out with appeal to values rather than facts and figures. Dr. Weston's book, The Political Brain, is largely about that too. So when people are writing their 30 second pitch, should they be getting into facts and figures yet? Or the 30 seconds should be all about values. And then once they're engaged, they get into facts and figures. That's kind of what I tend to think, but do you agree on that? That's a good question. I know the people in this room are very smart and love facts and figures because the facts and figures are very compelling. If you go if, if facts and figures, if those percentages are compelling to me, they must be compelling to the person I'm talking to in line in the grocery store, but maybe not so much. I don't I don't want to say that facts don't matter at all. There can be one or two nuggets that are can be really helpful. Um, I don't exactly remember what the fact was, but when I was working to advance some tenant protection bills in the legislature, we talked about evictions skyrocketing 200%. But that's really the only stat that we use. Like that's, people can get their hands, or actually you didn't say 20%, don't use percentages, you said that they don't. So you could use some facts to shore up your point to show that you're not just making stuff up. But what you're really hoping to do is connect to people um, in their heart, not their brain. Yeah, I've heard the phrase, the way to uh, reach someone's brain is through their heart. So, so, so should the 30 second pitches have any facts and figures? Um, I think, well, it sort of depends on how you start. Um, that's a really good question. I think about that. Um, if you have something that shows how difficult it is for people to get care in a short way. I would not talk about taxes. I would not talk about money. I would not talk about cost savings. Here's the other thing my husband does. And again, I am counting on all of you to not send this slide to him. <laughs> we were talking actually last night at dinner about an issue that I know a lot about. I have a lot of data about it. I work on it. And he was talking about it and he had some things wrong because of his personal experience, things that he had seen. And I pulled out my data because sometimes I don't, you know, do my own, do the right work that I'm teaching to you um, because he wanted to have an intellectual conversation. I pulled out my data and he said, why would I believe data when I have eyes and I have seen this? I was like, wow, thank you. You just gave me a great anecdote for tomorrow. <laughs> So, so another thing that we kind of go back and forth on a little is the term single payer. So I asked about the terminology. That's a term we've been using for a while because it means what it means and it's super short and simple. You know, like Dr. Weston had said that the term single payer was very neutral. Like it wasn't inspiring, but people weren't allergic to it. But that was also from the studies he did a few years ago. So. You know, still that 48 versus 59 percent talking facts and figures to this room, <laughs> but 11 percent doesn't sound like much, but that in reality is probably pretty huge. So, in our 30 second pitches, should we not be using the term single payer until we really know who we're talking to and what that person believes? Um. I don't know why you would talk about it if you are trying to do a shared vision. What if, if you are trying to get somebody engaged in your vision first, like you've got them in the elevator, they are not hostage. Why would you talk about how you get there in the first 30 seconds? Why wouldn't you talk about what you want? And then if they have follow-up questions, if it's a longer elevator ride. You can maybe talk about a way to get there or the way that you believe is best and again bring some value space and message you to that. But when you start talking about how we're gonna pay for this massive change, then people are gonna say, Do I agree that that's the right way to pay for this? Wait, what? I thought we were talking about a doctor for everyone. I thought we were talking about everybody having access. I thought we were talking about people being able to get prescription drugs. Why are we talking about this? All right, what do you think? Well, um, I I think that there has been a big change in 
how many of our words and terms are have like a taint, like a political taint. People understand them to be a part of a political agenda compared to five years ago. Um, I also think that we can't afford to lose eleven percent support. So if it means not using single payer and keep building instead of losing that eleven percent, then why would we use single payer? Right. Wow. Follow up and clarify kind of what you were getting at there. I think was start with the vision, meaning start with what we will accomplish, and single payer is how we get there. And so you don't start with that. You work back. Yeah, you don't start with that. You don't start with the policy that you want changed. You start with the with the improvements that we want in the healthcare system. So when you when you start with that, you're not asking people to agree or disagree with the path that you think we should take. You're getting them to agree with you on the things that we all want. We want to be able to get a doctor or a healthcare provider when we call them. We want to be able to afford it. We want every if we can get it. We want everybody in our community to get it. That's what we want. Great, thank you. That's very enlightening because it, for so many years we've been so focused on policy, it's hard to take a step back and get away from just talking about the policy and talk about the vision. So this is really great to hear. Um, so how are we doing on time? Do we take questions from the audience? I'm sure no one in this room has a question. Uh, so I hate to bring up a really sticky widget right away, but you know, you talked about starting with shared values. So my question is going to be, what if your values aren't shared. Like, where do you go from there? So, just real quickly, I was over at a neighbor's and brought up a conversation about health care. His brother was visiting from Texas. <laughs> and, and, okay, hear me out. This, this is just Texas, folks. This is Oregon, too, okay? Like, did, so his whole thing was well, if it covers immigrants, that's the whole problem, and it ain't going to happen. He didn't want to hear about anything else. If people were going to be included, that he didn't, you know, he thought that was about anything. And that's, you know, there are people that hold that. So, I mean, like, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it's like, how would you approach when you, if you have a basic shared value like that, like, like, uh, Chun Wei was talking about, you know, who gets it is going to be like, a, 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 you know, that's going to be a topic that came up in the past. Years. So, I'm just kind of throwing it out yeah. with your perspective on that. Well, there's two different kinds of ways to think about that. If you're thinking about like maybe trying to convince the public or a ballot measure, 30% of the people are never going to agree with you. You should not worry about them. Do not worry about them. I know in Texas, my brother-in-law is a doctor in Texas, and after Medicaid expansion, I said, why did you all, why did the Texas Medical Association support expansion? You would get paid for the people that you are seeing in the ER now. And he said, and he's a Republican, he said, we just could not get behind government health care. We just could not do it. Maybe it would be smarter, but we just could not do it. It was trying, it was philosophical. Don't worry about them. You just say, okay, great, we have a difference of opinion. But there will be people, most people will have shared values with you around what you want for health care. Oh, but, but the other audience, because you're trying to do something legislatively and arguments like that have an outsized importance in the legislature. And that's more of a strategic question that you all have to work on than a messaging question. I would also add something that we are seeing increasing common ground on is that uh, government is largely wasteful and inefficient. And so that is really a concern that you will probably run into a lot. And it's not just Republicans. We're talking 
I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's over 50% um, say that government is wasteful and inefficient versus government does a better job than we give it credit for. So that is another opportunity to talk about how um, we manage the system in a way that doesn't give away our advantages. Um, people are also really worried about the economic system. 80% of Oregonians say the economic system in this country unfairly favors powerful interests. Right. So um, that that is something that when you run into people that have a really negative reaction, you probably agree that the system is rigged. And people didn't just come to these beliefs. It's not their personal experience in government. This is a sustained campaign ever since right to yes. destroy belief in the government. Yep, it's unfortunate. Just again, do you want to grab the mic and just let people online kind of hear me over here? Uh, if you have a question, you are online, please just go ahead and put it in the chat. We're going to be paying attention to that and we will call those out. I don't think we have any at this moment, but we'll keep a, a close eye on that. Dr. Bass. Thank you. Most of us in the room are just like me politically. We're in for the bleeding our tax and spend on home county Democrats. And our values on health care expand into other areas. These are free, this is justice, reproductive rights, low cost housing. How can we deal with our own internal value system that are directly related to health care? When we're trying to sell health. What do you mean? How do you, I'm sorry, how, what do you mean? How do you deal with them? I fear that I will approach someone and inadvertently say, Let me tell you how your tax dollars can provide free abortion to any woman, not a man. Oh, and we're also going to provide universal care and efficient health care. Yeah. Don't say that. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I can understand the, the, the compulsion to do it, I guess, but that's why we're here. And you have a big support system in this room to help you not do that. Um, <laughs> uh, I. I've recently been reading about inoculating people against the lies that they will tell by the opposition. Yeah. And we are now powerful enough that we have opposition that's come out of their closet enough for us to get some clues of how they're going to attack our program. There are, of course, several dimensions to that, but the number one that comes to mind today is they argue that it costs too much. And we play into that when we say, would you support it even if it costs more? No. So I have, okay. they say, we would go out with them sooner. Yeah. Would you course. support sure. it even if it costs more? Yeah. So I, I'm wondering what you think of my two favorite numbers. And I, 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 I agree deeply with the values thing, and especially the positive approach about the better world we're working for. One of my favorite numbers is our health care costs twice as much as in other developed countries. Right. And my other favorite number is the task force created by SB 770 put together numbers showing that if we adopted the recommended single payer system, our buildings would collectively save one billion dollars. Yeah. Savings to the people of Oregon. Not cost more, cost one billion dollars less. Those are numbers I would like to see, even in uh, many other scientific places. Uh -huh. Okay, so those are good numbers. I do not think people care about other countries. They don't care at all about other countries um, and what's happening there. Um, and again, super sustained effort against the national health system, right? Because they don't want it here. So American politicians diss it. Everybody loves it when there's a bad story. Um, the, the cost issue, um, 
is a really interesting one. Nobody knows what a billion dollars is, but what is our current health system costing us now might be an interesting reframing of that. The average Oregonian is spending X, Y, Z. We think we can do better than that. Does something like that make sense? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, am I in charge of calling on people? Sorry. <laughs> there is someone online. Um, Cynthia Johnson, who has trouble typing, I'm going to go ahead. Cynthia, go ahead and take yourself off of you and ask your question. Thank you. Yes, um, I have I'm a longtime health advocate and, and certainly here because I support. We're not here can, can you hear me? It's coming to my ear pods. Oh, oh. <laughs> here, I can change the. Uh... Why don't we take do someone else and I'll change the with the audience. Go with Lou here and then we'll come back to that question. So basically the Supreme Court took away close to your mouth, Lou. Close to your mouth. Took away a woman's right to choose. Um she treated for re her reproductive rights. And I know it's one of the key words to my was the choice. Does the panel have any suggestions how to run uh, the word choice and how to present that to the women that will come coming out in multitude to vote? Um, that's a great question. So back to the slide that said words matter. I have a friendly amendment to what you just said. The Supreme Court did not change, take away women's rights. MAGA justices did that. And it's really important that we make that separation because people are losing their belief in government. And it's really important that people don't lose faith in the Supreme Court and they understand that it's specific judges with a specific agenda appointed, appointed by a specific president, which was not your question, but to that point. Um, so is your question about how to talk about choice in the election? As it relates to the uh, right. election. Right. Um, that is not something I've been working on. I'm going to do this. What do you think? <laughs> In Oregon, that was not a popular decision. We don't have high support for um, denying people choice in Oregon. So part of it is that the, that's not um, the a huge area of contention because the support for um, banning abortion in Oregon is pretty low. Um, I will echo what Patty said about it really has compromised people's faith in the justice system across the board. That is something that we've been tracking and it has greatly contributed. Um, the justice system tends to be like a the one that doesn't move a lot when it comes to people's trust and it is plummeting. And it's plummeting at the national level and it's plummeting at the local level as well. So um, I, you, I wouldn't worry too much about using choice in particular, especially women in Oregon are pretty supportive of that. Um, and it's just a small, loud minority. And there are also people that just are not going to budge regardless. Right. Yeah, 30%. yeah, I would think talking about opening with reproductive rights before you know who you're talking to is probably not the way to go, but speaking more broadly as you have your choice of the care you get, or you have your choice of care, your choice of doctor. <laughs> Should work. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. yeah, it's great. Thank you. Um, I didn't see in the questions a lot um, I, much about disability. 
people with disabilities and the chronically ill and lived experience. And so I think that's a very important group. There's like millions of us certainly, um, and uh, I um, advocate in that community. So I, I wanted to know, I think we need to figure out how best to address a group of people that are already in cracks and canyons, so to speak, and how how we can, can I think some people, in other words, are gonna wanna know how will this improve their true access to healthcare. And I think that might be an important point. And certainly a community I'm not sure was questioned a lot, and particularly in Oregon, I know, because often um, rural and urban, you know, if you need specialists or you're disabled or you need telemedicine, you know, that's all one in the same. So I just kind of wanted to see how can we make sure that we address the chronically ill and the disabled in our state. I think that's a really important point. Thank you for bringing it up. So the the messages that we talked about can and should be expanded. Your access to healthcare should not be based on your zip code, your race, your ability, your um, level of health. Everybody should have equal access and should have the care that they need that is best for them when they need it. So that can all be expanded. Does that answer your question? Mostly, but I think a little more that we may need to reach out. I just wanted to bring that up. It's, oh, it's, 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 not, it's a really good point. Yeah. It's a, a really, it's a missed community, but also they may have, to, you know, be, being positive isn't enough when you've had a lot of negative experiences. Yeah. So that's, and I'm a cancer survivor as well. So um, besides being disabled by a chronic illness for 15 years. So I think that, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up as how we integrate, because mm -hmm. sometimes for some people, I think addressing those hard issues may be more appealing than just once again promising you something that's not been delivered in the past, if that makes sense. I see. That. And I think with the disability community, particularly um, since the pandemic, there's a lot more people that are chronically ill. And so I think we just, I just want us to be cognizant of, of maybe some messaging may be a little bit different. And nobody's more of an expert of negotiating the bad healthcare system than people who have to access, try to access it all of the time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to add that in that group of people that said that they postpone care, there is an overrepresentation of people who have chronic illnesses and people who have disabilities who have postponed care for all other reasons. And so they are in that group. We also ask people if they have been treated unfairly when seeking health care based on disability. And 8% said that happened to them. 7% said that happened to a family member. 4% said both them and a family member. Um, so um, those people really know what it means not to be able to access care and are really um, on the front lines for the people that are not able to access care, especially for cost and availability. Thank you so much. I just want to say we'll take um, uh, one more uh, question in the room and one more online, if there is one, or maybe two in the room if there's not one online and weapons, do you have those like Thank you again for this discussion. Um, how do you do this? You practice. You do it every single day. You can talk about healthcare. You're supposed to talk. I like one on one. Standing in the grocery store, you turn to the person behind you. How's your day going? If you're standing in the post office or in an elevator, people just stand. They don't talk. Talk. Ask them how they're doing. What's going on? How is health insurance working for you? I love to talk about, haven't heard too much about it, insurance. We are working on a system to minimize insurance and bring back a relationship between doctors and patients like we used to have in the old days. People heard up. They start talking about what's going on with their lives. The next thing you know, you have a bit more conversation. Then you hand them a card and you say, we're having our meeting at the Rogue Valley chapter, and would you come to our meeting? We would love to hear your story there. That's how you do it. Practice, practice, practice. Do it every day. That's how you become better. Thank you, Gail. Thank you very much.
I have a question. Um, the idea of um, necessary services to keep our communities going, we have roads, bridges, schools, police force, and this is a piece that we um, we all benefit from also reviewing it and evaluating what the community serves. Does that work? The infrastructure, there's been a lot of work, we don't know about this too. There's been a lot of work trying to equate infrastructure like roads and bridges to things that are less tangible. And there are some people who are true believers in that, like a religion for them. But it's kind of just, I don't know, do people still, are they still trying to work on that? I mostly see it with childcare. Um, yeah. People really talk about that as infrastructure now because of the way it supports multiple systems. It's supporting the education system, it's supporting the economic system, um, it's supporting our economic future. Um, but that's that's the only one that I've seen that's sort of outside the norm. For, oh, well, I guess also um, internet. And that's, you know, it's arguable whether that is at the norm for infrastructure. Um, but that one I think is an easy sell. And I would point out that Oregon's um, transportation system is $6 billion underfunded. So uh, people talking about infrastructure hasn't led to adequate infrastructure. It doesn't feel personal enough to me. Unless you talk about potholes in your neighborhood and not the system. That's such a good point. There you go. Yeah. So just real quick, I think the term infrastructure, yeah, unless it's in the frame of child care, People just kind of tune out, they don't care. The phrase necessary services, community, dot, 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 person you're talking to will tune out. That's not an emotional value based statement. They have to, then they have to go get to what do I think is necessary? Is it necessary? What's not in their brain if you've lost it? So, shockingly, I lied. So, we're going to do two final questions in the okay. air. Uh, John was the last question. Sorry, David. Sorry, everybody else. Otherwise, we'll just be here all afternoon. But guess what? We have a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, my name is Marie Sabelga, and um, I'm speaking to you with my own voice and the languages that I know and whatnot. I want you to look around and we're talking about pieces like that. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to look around the room and see who you are, who are here. When I go for health care, I am a retired clinician, college professor. I get asked if I speak English because my name is Marisa Bell Governor, which doesn't make sense to anybody. So trust me, there are people in the United States, a significant population, who work and make life possible for this great country who can't get health care because their skin looks like this and because they have funky names. Keep that in mind, please. Well, I'm going to echo what Patty says and say you start with values. That's actually why I started working at the Oregon Diocese and Police Centers. And to, after 2016, it was like, if truth and facts don't matter or aren't real, then what is real? And it's what people believe and what people value. And so that doesn't depend on um, facts and figures and numbers. That's what people value. And in Oregon, we have a lot of shared values regardless of our political color or our age. Um, so yeah, start with values. And almost every person that you run into has at some point had a bad experience in the healthcare system. So remembering that every single time you talk to somebody, at some point, I guarantee they've had some sort of bad experience, whether it's a minor inconvenience to really severely debilitating. <clears throat>
We're giving my ignorance, but is the next phase you're going to pass legislation? Like, is that? Yes. It's not a ballot measure. It's well, a good point. Yeah. We're a front to the establishment. Right. And they decide they have to stop. Sorry, I might have taken this down the wrong path. So uh, we are at the place where we have the Universal Health Insurance Government Board yes. that is taking the work that's been done over decades yes. Yes. Right, to create our new simplified equitable reporting system. So yeah. We're at the place where um, folks are wanting to advocate to that board, right? But to the board. Bill and yeah. here's the thing, and why this conversation is so important. We have to build the healthcare constituency. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Because yeah. when lawmakers and people in power do not make decisions based on actual information, they make decisions based on who is powerful and who has money, who is writing checks to them. Um, so they will say they're making a decision based on logic and they will use those arguments and they, the opposition will have some arguments that they will feel comfortable saying because it will make them feel smart and there'll be a certain number of their voters who will, or their constituency who will think that. But the many always beats money. If you have enough of a movement, yes. then that's how you win. It's not just messaging, it's the movement to marry that's point. 